Hey guys, it's Landon Blake from Redefined Horizons, and this is the video we're doing for our book on land tenure, chapter three. And I should have grabbed it, sorry. Land tenure, chapter three. We're going through this book, we're doing a video on each chapter, we're doing that book and the book on Brown's Founding Control and Link Principles. So, chapter three, lots of good information. I'm not going to cover a bunch of it in the video, and I'll tell you why. So they talk about the origins of land title in different parts of the United States. So some parts are Dutch, some parts are Russian, some parts are French. Over here in the southwest, we have Spanish origins of our land title. So I'm not going to get into the detail the, the chapter in the book does, going over each of those regions. Uh, I encourage you, in your chapter, of the, in your copy of the book, to read the, the part of the the chapter that talks about the portion of the United States that you work in. But there were some general kind of concepts in chapter three that I wanted to go over. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about land title in the 13 colonies versus the, what we call the public domain states, public land states. Okay. So let's start chapter three and talk a little bit about in the very beginning of the chapter, he talks about the difference between civil law and common law. And we want to talk about that because as a land surveyor, you're actually guided by both of those. So you're, you're, you're guided by civil law and you're also guided by common law. And that's because real estate law comes from both of those. Okay. And then in addition, if you're a land surveyor, you know, things like, um, contract law that you use and liability, that's also governed, can be governed by civil code, civil law and common law. So you got to know that just as a, as a professional and a business person. But specifically in this book, he's bringing it up because Real estate law, land law in the United States is, is based on those two sources, civil law and common law. He talks about the differences. Now, there's another type of law that land surveyors have to worry about, which is called administrative law. I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get into administrative law in this video. It's not talked about in this book, but it is an important thing for surveyors to understand. We'll cover it in some other videos. So let's talk about those two kinds of law for a few minutes, civil law and common law. Talk about how they're different from one another and how they relate to land law. So civil law is basically where most of the laws are written down. So they're in written form. We call that code. Um, so for example, in California, surveyors are governed by the business and professions code. Okay. So it's called a code, codified laws. Okay. And code just means written statements. Okay. It's not like computer code or a secret code. <laughs> code is in codified as in written down. So the laws are written down in places governed by common law. So there's countries that are governed by common law. Um, like every law gets written down, the law, you know, the written laws, volumes of massive amounts of written law. They're very, the law code, the actual written laws are very comprehensive. They cover all aspects of life as a general rule. In a common, or excuse me, in a civil law system, the book, the book explains the role of the judge is to determine the facts of a case and then to rule on how the code, the written laws, apply to the facts. Okay, so he's basically interpreting, making decisions about facts, weighing evidence and making decisions about facts, and then applying the, applying the written law. Okay, that's what a judge does in a civil law system. Okay, common law is different. In common law, not all the laws are written down in, in code, in official statutes passed by a legislature. So I should clarify that. In a civil law system, Laws are written by a legislature, okay, like a Congress or a Senate. Okay, so judges don't make law, legislatures make law, judges rule on facts and then apply, apply the written laws to the facts. Okay, in a common law system, it's a little bit different. In a common law system, there are some rules, written rules. Uh, for example, there's written rules about how the courts work. But in a common law system, a lot of, of law is not written down in, by a legislature. It's not, it's not, created by a legislature, it's created by judges. So judges say, judges make rulings, they, they try and settle disputes, they try and be fair and they make rulings. And then over time, other judges try and follow those original rulings. So those rules become entrenched over time. That's called precedent. Judges try and respect prior decisions or precedent. Okay. And so in common law systems, judges are making a lot of the law. So they're, they're not just applying the law, they're also making law for future judges. And that's a common law system. Now, in America, in most states, we have a mix. So we have civil law, and then we also have common law. And the reason that's important for surveyors is in the United States, 
Real estate is governed by both, by civil law and by common law. Now, what's the proportion? In most places in the United States, way more real estate law is, is based in common law, or it's also called case law or judge-made law. Way more is based in case law than in than in civil code. So I would say, I don't know, it's a 20%, 80% mix in most places, or 15%, 85% mix. So 80 to 85% of what you do in real estate is going to be governed by common law. So how do you find common law? You got to go read cases and court decisions made by judges. I'm not going to get into, going to get deeply into that here in this video. Maybe I'll do some more videos about common law, but you basically have to read and understand court decisions. And if you're a land surveyor, you should know how to do that. So one of the things I was taught in college by my professor, Dave Dorsett, was how to go down and use a law library and research and apply common law that was, that, that applies to land surveyors. We were taught how to do that. So that's important. So those are the basic differences between civil law and common law. And uh, you have to understand both if you're going to be a land surveyor in the United States. Okay, so chapter 3 starts by explaining that. Then it goes in and talks about, <clears throat> in, the, in the rest of chapter 3, they're basically making the important connection between history and modern-day land surveying. And you can't be a modern-day land surveyor and not know and understand and respect history. And that's a real problem because a lot of surveyors, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are surveyors in our modern era they fall in love with technology and they fall in love with the math and they just, they just want to make measurements and apply rules of math and surveying is much more about the law and about history. And so in chapter three, the author's trying to make that connection. He's trying to explain that connection and I'm going to do my best to summarize it. So he basically says the rules, the customs and the units of measure that were in place when a parcel was created are going to govern how that parcel is retraced in a retracement survey. So. A parcel that was created in eight in California in 1860, that parcel is going to be retraced on the ground differently than a parcel that was created in uh, a subdivision in 2008. So, for example, my parcel from my house where I live, that was created in the early 2000s. You know, we're going to expect there to be monuments on the ground. We're going to expect the measurements are going to be pretty accurate, you know, within a tenth or two. Um, we're going to expect that the physical improvements were probably built pretty close to where the boundary's at given our ability to measure pretty close. Okay, but if I'm surveying a piece of farmland, a 40-acre or a 160-acre quarter section out in eastern San Joaquin County, where I live, and it was surveyed in 18, I don't know, 1800s, sometime in the late 1800s, and a guy was pulling a train, a chain and using a transit, um, you know, I'm going to have some different expectations for that survey, and there's going to be I'm going to use different methods to put it on the ground. So, for example, if I find a monument there that purports to be a retracement monument and it's out of place 20 feet, but it's been accepted for 100 years, I'm probably going to hold that monument. I probably wouldn't hold a retracement monument that was out of, that was out of uh, uh, 20 or 30 or 50 feet in my modern subdivision. I would, I would, I would presume that was a blunder. Uh, if I'm doing a, a, that survey in the farmland in eastern San Joaquin County, I'm probably not going to expect to find the original monuments, the original po wood posts or pits or, or stones that were set in the original survey because it's been 100, 150 years since that land was surveyed and it's been cultivated and it hasn't been surveyed a lot since the original survey and I'm probably not going to find very much. Whereas if I go out in my 2008, you know, 2005, whatever, that date of my subdivision, I'm going to expect to hopefully probably find some original monuments, some rebar and cap or some pipe and some cap, right? So the author is trying to explain that history is important because history is going to dictate the rules that you follow for your retracement survey and some of the judgment calls that you make in your, in your retracement survey. So here's a couple quotes that he makes that are related to that concept, the connection between history and retracement surveys. He says, a boundary, once established, must remain fixed in position through any series of conveyances. And that, that, that gets into part of what we talk about a little bit in the videos that we're doing on Brown's boundary control and legal principles. Once a boundary is fixed on the ground, it stays in place. So the boundary doesn't move as different deed conveyances are made through time, right? The boundary remains fixed in its original position, and you have to understand history and historical survey methods to understand where that boundary was probably put on the ground originally, because that may not correspond to the exact mathematical position that, that you're going to get based on just solely looking at the, at the measurements in a document, in a deed or a map, without any understanding of the historical context. Here's another quote. He says, uh, the original creating documents must be interpreted in accordance with the conditions and circumstances at the time. So that's what we are just talking about, right? So you got to 
when when that when that old deed says a hundred feet, that might not mean one hundred point zero 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 feet, right? At the time, it might mean a hundred and one feet or a hundred and two feet or even a hundred and five feet or ninety five feet. So you got you got to think about the methods and the equipment and the circumstances that the surveyor was operating in when he created that original document. I'll give you an example. We were recently wrapping up a, a boundary survey of downtown Oakdale here in my office this last week or two. And we found a couple of the maps that were, that didn't match each other by about two tenths. And Danny and I, my partner were talking about it. I'm teaching Danny some things. He's learning to be a good boundary surveyor. And I told him, Hey, you know, when they, when they laid out that original map of the town of Oakdale and established those blocks, first of all, they didn't set monuments hardly at all. There's a, there's a dozen monuments for a huge area. So there were no lock corners set. And you know, that guy was out. He was, he was pulling on a steel tape or a chain with a transit. I mean, if he was within two tenths, we're within two tenths on one of those blocks. That, that fits great, right? We're, we're not going to get super freaked out about how we handle that two tenths. So that's part of understanding the history, right, of the survey that you're retracing. He then goes on to talk a little bit about how the history of land title and land tenure and boundary surveying are, are connected, and that's important too. And so he says, uh, so I'm going to, I'll give you a quote here. He says, the establishment of boundaries locates and defines the extent of land tenure. The establishment of title is the foundation of tenure. So he's trying to connect their land tenure, which is how you hold land with land title, and the boundary survey. And so I'm going to just diagra di draw a diagram of how I think that works. Okay, so here you have, in the middle, I'm going to put land tenure. That's how you hold the land, okay? How you hold it. Are you a fee owner? Are you an easement holder? Are you a leaseholder? Can you pass that land on to your heirs? Can you sell it? Can you exclude people from it? What are the rules related to how you own and, and what you can do with your land? That's land tenure. Okay, land tenure is rooted in land title. So land title is, land title is the foundation of land tenure. So he's saying, hey, you gotta have some land title that get, gives you ownership, that gives you land tenure. Okay, and depending on the source of your title, the rules for your land tenure are going to be different, and I'll give an example. So in Stockton, we're in a Mexican land grant. Under Mexican law, Spanish law, if you're on a navigable body of water, the, the upland owner, the private upland owner, owes, owns to the center of the stream. If you're in a public land state, or if you're outside of a land grant in California in, in a public land area, the state owns the bed of the river. Okay, So there's a difference there. There's a difference in... The rules that dictate your how you hold your land and what you can do with it are based in the source of your title. And I see this in Stockton all the time because we have a blend. We've got public lands, we've got Spanish land grants, so I have to we have swamp and overflowed lands. So there's different rules for all three of those types of, of land title, right? Is your title from a swamp and overflow survey? Is it from a is it from a parcel that came from a Spanish land grant, or is it from a, a, from a, gr a grant that happened under the public land survey system? Okay, so land tenure is based on on how you got your land title. The land title is the foundation of land tenure. And then what he says is a boundary survey marks the limits of your lands of your land tenure. And so think about from a this is really important if you think about the example I just gave you. So if you're in a in a Mexican land grant here in California and you're trying to to delimit the limits of ownership of tenure. Right, and you're on a navigable body of water, the limit of ownership is in the center of the channel, unless contrary evidence can be shown. Whereas if you're in a public lands, if you're on the other side of the of the Mexican land grant boundary in the public lands, the limit is gonna be the, the, the high water mark. It's not it's not gonna be the center of the channel. So this is really important, right? All these things are connected, so he's trying to explain that. He's trying to explain that in the chapter there. Okay, so History is important, land surveyors, and history is important to how people hold their their source of title, which is a historical question, influences the type of, of ownership that they have. And when you do a boundary survey, you're trying to, to, to mark or locate that the limits of that ownership on the ground, and so you need to know those rules. All right, so then at the end of the chapter, he talks a little bit about some of the, the, the influences of the different legal systems, Dutch, Russian... Spanish, French, English that affected 
land title and land tenure in the United States. I'm not going to get into all those systems. Uh, but at the end of the chapter, he talks a little bit about the source of land title for the 13 colonies and then basically the rest of the country, which we call public domain states. And so I want to do briefly want to cover that. And I'm going to keep it really simple. Read the book. This is just kind of a, it's an overview. I'm trying to give you the, give you the key points. So in the original 13 colonies, essentially, your source of title was some kind of land grant from the, the, from the king or the queen of the nation that established the colony. So if it was a British colony, you needed a land, a land grant from the King of England, basically. Okay. So that's the source of most title in the 13 colonies. This, you go all the way back two, three hundred years to some original grant by a king or queen. Okay. Of a colonial power. If you're outside of the 13 colonies, you're in what we call the public domain states. And there's kind of three, sorry, there's two, two kind of scenarios there on, on the source of title. So for the eastern states, so this is basically states east of the Mississippi primarily that weren't part of the original 13 colonies, when they applied to become a state in the United States, so when they when they wanted to become part of the Union, part of the condition of their becoming a state in the Union was their unclaimed land was conveyed to the federal government. Okay, So those territories, when they became states, uh, when they were admitted to the Union, the federal government got huge parts of, of their unclaimed, unclaimed or unsettled land. Okay. Then in, in the other states, this is basically west of the Mississippi for the most part. Um, those lands were were directly acquired by the federal government, so not from a territory. They were dir- directly acquired from the federal government through a series of uh, either purchases or treaties with foreign nations. And there's basically, the book outlines six major ones. I'm going to give them to you. So the Louisiana Purchase, we bought a huge amount of land from France. The Texas annexation, so when Texas stopped being an independent republic and became a state, we got Texas. Uh, the Red River Basin, that's a little chunk of land up on the northern border of the United States. Uh, the Oregon Compromise, that was a deal we made with Britain. We got a bunch of land in the northwest, Pacific Northwest. The Mexican cessation, that was uh, when we uh, when we won the, the Mexican-American War. Part of the Treaty of Guadalupe was that we got a, a bunch of land there. So that covers most of the southwest, including California. And then there was a little bit of land we, we went in, disputed land that we went in later in Arizona and New Mexico and we, and we bought from Mexico. There was, a, a, there was a deal made there that was called a Gadsden purchase. So if you're in the western states west of the Mississippi, your source of title comes from one of those uh, particular either uh, uh, treaties or, or purchase agreements. That's the source of your title. All the land went into federal ownership before it went into private ownership. So that's basically... Chapter 3 of the book on land tenure. Next video, we'll cover some important stuff from chapter 4.